Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a fun show for you this evening. Rick Peterson is here, one of the top air show announcers in the industry, and it's going to be so much fun learning what goes on behind the air show in the industry and everything that's been going on, of course, uh, during the past uh, year plus uh, through this uh, very tumultuous time that's getting uh, that we're all coming out of now, and and so really really exciting stuff. Before we get started, as always, a few notes. Uh, tonight's broadcast will be recorded and available on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and type in one word social flight and you'll find all the past programs with such wonderful wonderful guests here on the show hearing all their stories and learning from them and learning more about this aviation world that we all love in addition to that be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free social flight mobile apps for apple and android devices again it is completely free and it has tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations the hundred dollar hamburgers are all in there and also the fly to win challenge where you can go in there and and just land even once during a prize period get some points for landing at an airport and you'll be entered in to win a prize and we have given away some of the most amazing prizes from our partners so be sure to check all of that out and our current prize is a custom pair of flying eyes eyewear so that's going to be given away fairly shortly be sure to check all of that out now, without further ado, chances are if you have attended more than a few air shows, you have already listened to Rick Peterson bring the air show to life and connect the audience to the performers flying above and, and so many other things going on at the same time. Rick is one of the top air show announcers in the industry, as well as an award-winning uh, broadcast journalist with over 30 years of experience. Rick's credits include being the voice of Fleet Week San Francisco, the Los Angeles Air Show, the Canadian International Air Show, Friendship Day, MCAS, I, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, <laughs> Iwakuni, Japan, and the Sanicol Air Show in Belgium. I'm going to bring Rick on now here. Rick is also an honorary member of the Snowbirds Jet Demonstration Team and co-host of the award-winning podcast, Show Center, the Air Show Podcast. And he's here tonight to take us behind the scenes to the air shows that bring all of us together as an aviation community. Welcome, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here, Jeffrey. Thank you for having me. I just saw myself on the screen, and I've had that OMG moment where when all this COVID nonsense started, I only weighed 98 pounds. Look at me now. Look what it's done. To me. It's destroying me, Jeffrey. Terrible. You know, it, uh, you know, we're we're all in the same boat here. We just have to do more flying, and uh, that fixes everything. That's what I've been told. Apparently, that burns calories. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so listen, I want to start with a picture because the, I, I want to go back and hear how, about your aviation background. That's one of the things that thrills me the most. And you sent me a picture here that is one of, uh, I'm going to call it the, the cutest aviation pictures that I've seen of, uh, uh, you're going to take a picture here and you know lose the teddy bear in the mall and trying to get a kid to smile and do all these other things. You put a kid on a, on a spinner on a prop, I'm in. What is going on? Well, this is this is Smith Falls, Ontario, Canada. That's my dad holding me uh, at my first air show. And I followed him around the air shows for years. Uh, the tail dragger, the, the cub uh, is, is how it all started for me. And, uh, and then it blossomed through him. I always tell folks that my father gave me wings. My mother gave me a trumpet. Uh, <laughs> she wanted me to pursue music as a career because she thought it was was safer. Uh, but I managed to pursue both. But when it came decision time down the road, I, I fooled both of them and went into journalism instead of, uh, of, of flying. But I've always kept it as a passion and, uh, and continued to do it. Uh, and, and, of course, now through air shows, it's my primary job. This is what I do, air show announcing. And I love every aspect of it. Wow. So, so bring me back. Tell me about your history with what you learned in aviation and with that. And obviously it was in your family, uh, regardless of the fact that for some reason you're saying that your mother felt that the music industry would be more stable for you than a, a career in aviation. Until, until my father pointed out how most jazz musicians' uh, careers ended and it was never pretty. Uh, but no, the, the aviation thing, going to the air shows with my dad, 
uh, gave me a chance, and as a broadcaster as I got older um, and continued to go to some of the uh, local air shows with him, uh, I got a chance to see how it inspired people, how it connected them to aviation, how it inspired them to fly. And now that I've done this for as many years as I have, I get the stories from Snowbird pilots, from Thunderbird pilots, from Blue Angels, the demonstration pilots that tell me that the hooks went in when they saw their first air show as well. We're in the inspiration business, basically, inspiring people to uh, take up aviation in any aspect of that and uh, turn it into a very rewarding career is what it's been all about. So dad used to take me around and then uh, I started to apply my aspects and, and knowledge of showmanship to what we do and found a niche in the market to create storylines, much along the way that Guy La Liberté did with, um, uh, with the Cirque du Soleil, uh, where like air shows, you would have a dozen performers all come in, the original circuses, the old circuses, if you will, would have these performers all come in and do their thing, and at the end of the night, you were amazed. Uh, but then Guy La Liberté came along with, uh, with Cirque du Soleil in Montreal, and decided to take those 12 performers and put them into a theme, tell a story and tie it all together. And I started to do that with the narrations that I was doing at air shows uh, with respect to the fact that the Blue Angels have uh, their, their thing they have to do and uh, the demonstration teams and recruitment and all of those things. But there was still a way to tie a thread with music and narration and storytelling that would inspire people so that by the end of the day, uh, you were just ready to flap your arms and fly and maybe connect to it as a rewarding career or at least understand aviation a little bit better and, and its importance too. So that was my mission and so far it's paid off and uh, I get to do it all around the world. Wow. And and how did you get your, your first start from switching or enhancing your broadcast career with actually get, starting to get behind the scenes of an air show? It was a tragic start, to, to be honest. Uh, I was attending, it's where I met my wife for the first time too. I was attending an event in Montreal where I cut my teeth, where my broadcasting career uh, really took place, almost 40 years of radio television there. And a, a, a wonderful market, Montreal is, uh, is the second largest market in Canada. It's a big city, it's, uh, it's got a European flavor to it uh, with, with its French aspect in Quebec and a marvelous place to be uh, in media. And I was attending their local show in the mid-1980s. And um, it was at uh, the smaller airport. There are three airports around Montreal. This was a smaller one where there is a, an aviation institute there, a school. And one of the teachers was flying uh, as part of the air show in a hyperbite. And unfortunately, uh, was flying with a smoke system. And the hyperbite, as you know, is all closed uh, cockpit. And unfortunately, uh, he got too much of the exhaust, the smoke oil lost consciousness as the flight crashed and was killed. They didn't oh really God. have an air show. Uh, it, was, it was horrible. They didn't have a, a professional air show announcer at that event. They had what was called an event announcer. And event announcers in those times usually came with the local beer company who would take over the sponsorship of the event and provide a talking voice and a van from which to do it and speakers and a sound system. And in this case, it was a very small uh, O'Keefe company and uh, unfortunately, the gentleman that was doing this knew nothing really of aviation. Uh, the pilot's wife was next to him. There was calls for a priest on the PA and everything was just, it was just unorganized and it was, uh, it was regrettable. And it made a sad story even sadder, to be honest. So the next year I volunteered to help out as far as narration would go and uh, then got involved with the International Council of Air Shows, ICAS, uh, to learn how it's done professionally and the talking points and the things we need to know to better, because part of what we do as an air show announcer is certainly entertain and inform, but we're also a very important part of the safety aspect of air shows, that being crowd control, uh, knowing how to talk to a crowd in the event of an accident, uh, knowing how to move them around if uh, congestion becomes an issue, and, uh, and connect to them and build their trust throughout the day. And that's not something just anyone can do. You have to build that up over time and learn some of the techniques and, and honestly just be real and, uh, and you can win them over and, and you'll know that, that you can manipulate them in ways that are going to help if the situation uh, is needed, whether it's a hot, hot, humid day where dehydration is a problem. Uh, there's so many aspects of, of their well-being that you're looking after as well 
uh, through the organizers and and the effort of the air show to make sure everybody stays healthy and happy too. So all of those aspects, emergency plans and things like that, are all part of the homework that go into uh, presenting the air show as the announcer, and not just knowing about the airplanes or the pilots. And then the next step in that process was to take the time to learn who the people are, because I've always said this about stories, and, and the other professional announcers in the industry know this well too. It's the story, it's the person that is going to connect best to the audience. So who is that man? Who is that woman that's flying the airplane and how did they get there? The announcer's not the star. We're not the stars standing on the, we're kind of the conduit. We're, we're explaining and connecting them to that person. They're the stars. Um, they're the, the people that have put in the time and, and the effort to get to where they are, to sit in the F-22, to sit in the F-35, to fly the, the Oracle Challenger or the uh, Lucas Oil Pits. Uh, all of these performers, Mike and Sean and all of them, I had to get to know them and know their stories so I can know them personally. And one of the best ways to do that was to become a spot announcer for a season and travel along with them as part of the show. So John Moore at the time, and I don't think anybody flies to this day flies a Stearman as well as John Moore did, a stock Stearman too, not with the big engine, but the original smaller engine. Uh, he took me on as uh, his spot announcer. And uh, at the time he was doing the helicopter transfer act and all of those things. And I had a hoot uh, for an entire season, just hanging along with them and handling his announcing and getting to meet the other people behind the scenes and the other shows. And, right. uh, and that's, that's the stepping stones in how, you know, you get to where you can confidently get up in front of people, know the performers and know the uh, personalities that you're talking about, and then connect the audience to what they do. So, Rick, let me let me ask you a question here because uh, I'm learning some te terminology, and I'll bet some other people are as well. And you mentioned spot announcer. So, what there, uh, just as someone who who doesn't know the other side of the of that, you know, I go to an air show, and yeah, you listen to the main announcers, and then all of a sudden, someone else is on the mic who's directly connected sometimes to the cockpit, knows exactly what the story is, what the script is they're reading. Is that the spot announcer you're talking yeah. about? That is a good question because, yes, I get caught up in some of our, our lingo, but that is what the spot announcer is. The F-22 uh, has its own announcer. Most of the military teams do. The Navy does it a little bit differently. Uh, often they'll hand it off to us, which is fine, uh, to get it done because they know we can do it. In cases where they might not know that it's a professional air show announcer, they may have uh, their, their second crew do the narration for them. Uh, so everybody does it a little bit differently, but the Air Force do their own. And of course, the teams have their own announcers. And these are referred to, and, and Sean D. Tucker uh, over the years, uh, some of the other performers like John uh, travel with a spot announcer as well. In other words, their own announcer. And uh, as a, a show announcer, we welcome that uh, because it gives us a bit of a break, uh, a chance to recharge. Uh, they're watching out for things, but all the time that they are on stage and they're announcing, uh, the emergency plan is always, if anything goes wrong, they hand it right back to us, mm. you know, and we have to the crowd from that point on and they have to deal with what they have to deal with. So there's agreements in all of that. So it's never a get down off the podium and go away. That's why in all of our contracts, we have a clause in there that says that there has to be a, a dedicated porta potty at show center for us. Because we can't ever be in a situation where we're standing in line waiting to go, if you know what I mean, and then have to go, if you know what I mean. And where this gets a little tricky is in different cultures. So that is in my contract. And the first time I went to Belgium to do the Santa Cole air show, uh, the Belgians, the Europeans have a different whole take on going to the washroom in public places. Uh, their porta potty for men is basically an oversized athletic cup on a stick. <laughs> and uh, if you can just visualize that for a second, something about the size of, a, of your, this big on a stick, basically with a little hose that goes down to a, a thing at the bottom. And that in is public. Where, in public. And that is where the men go, you turn your back and everything. Well, it, I said, it, where is where's my porta potty when I first got there? Because I want to get the lay of the, the ground and everything. And they said, it's, it's right there. And you have to understand, this is in front of 30,000 people. This little <laughs> thing, back of the ground, 
to which luckily they had turned around so that I'm actually turning my back to the crowd. Needless to say, I held the entire day. There's no way I was good at you. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but there's something about our Social Play Live evenings that always seem to come around to bathrooms, the things and experiences. So, yes, no question. That is, uh, you, <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, an opportunity too, Knox, because someone's got to figure it out on this side of the ocean. Canadians don't do this. Americans don't do this. But over in, in Europe, they actually pay to use the facilities because it's cleaned. Uh, after every usage, there's a whole thing to it, and it's a money-making opportunity for the air shows over there. People get these colored wristbands, which means you can go to the full-service station, if you, if you will, or you can go to the quickie uh, service station, and that's a different colored band, but it, all in all, it's paid for, and that pays for the cleanings and all of that stuff as well. So it's, it's just a wow. different... Wow, so it's not just a matter of avgas and regulation and all the cost of flying. If you actually want to go to an air show, you need to think about how much you actually want to invest in relieving yourself in That's Europe. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there is, there is relief some, control going <laughs> on. In some of the tickets, I think it's probably included, depending on what, what you buy. But I always found that... <laughs> And, uh, and they, they did arrange something different for me the next year, which I was very appreciative of. It was very close by the VIP uh, porta potty, if wow. you will. Very nice. Now, tell me a little bit about the communications, because, you, you know, it's very interesting. I didn't really think about it in the beginning, of course, that you are managing so many different aspects under your responsibilities from crowd control and the health of the crowd to emergency management and what would happen in those cases. And... And there must be communication channels happening for all of those things. There are. How, how does yeah. that happen at the same time as you're narrating? Right. Well, it happens well before we ever hit the hit show center, as we call it in the podcast. Um, usually what happens is Thursday are the tabletop exercises. And right. that's where the announcement air boss and we all sit down together on the Thursday uh, evening or sometimes Friday morning before the rehearsal on Friday. Uh, to go over these scenarios, and uh, they will call a scenario. And then on rehearsal day Friday, uh, the air boss will do a similar thing and call out a scenario uh, as it's done as a live event. Uh, they, they'll surprise the emergency responders and stuff at a given time, and uh, uh, they have to respond to that. The timings are done, uh, and then it's, there's an evaluation and a debrief done afterwards. So all of that planning goes into ahead of time uh, by emails, phone conversations, and, and scheduled meetings. Uh, then there's the tabletop discussions uh, before the event, and then the rehearsals on Friday, and then we're ready for show day Saturday and Sunday. In the olden days, Saturday used to be the quiet day. Sunday used to be the monster day. That has changed somewhat in the last 10 years to where Saturday is now your monster day, and Sunday is the, is the quieter day. Uh, a lot of events, though, since this pandemic now, as we're coming out of it, both days are huge. But yeah. uh, it it means that you have to hit the ground running, that Saturday you have to have everything in place, uh, know where the weaknesses are, fix those things, and be ready for the show because there's so much involved in it. It's not just the flying. There's everything on the ground from hospitality to entertainment uh, to the traffic, the ingress, egress getting people in and out at home safely. All of those things are things that, uh, for the most part, are handled by volunteers with a small structure of organizers and a large group of volunteers that give up their time generously to get this done so that we can promote aviation. All air shows are not for profit. Uh, so that means that they're helping out community through charity. Uh, all the proceeds are going back into the community. And uh, that's, that's the way it's always been. It's the way it'll always be. And it's, uh, it's fun to be a part of that. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, give you some examples of things so I can understand more about what's happening behind the scenes. In, the, in, in many of the air shows that myself and I'm sure most people in the audience have attended, uh, you've had situations that vary to include uh, a problem with an act that can't get an airplane started or isn't actually ready to go when they say you're ready to go or uh, weather that's being watched coming in that all of a sudden a, a, a decision's gonna get made at the last minute uh, about uh, you know what, what's gonna happen and what's not gonna happen. Sometimes that's really last minute. How, how does that get communicated when you're 
actually talking, getting ready to start saying what's next. <laughs> That's where you build up this uh, wonderful working relationship with the air bosses. And uh, there's a, a small group of very um, talented and fun people to work with, uh, very serious minded because the responsibility is there. Wayne Boggs, and Ralph Royce up in Canada, there's David White, there's, there's a whole series of them, uh, George Klein. I don't want to leave anybody out or I'll never hear the end of it. But these guys are great <laughs> to work with. They know how you work. They get to know you too. So often it'll be a tap on the shoulder uh, or they'll just lift my earpiece or sometimes just slip me a note that says, uh, you know, Scooter can't get the Mustang started. Uh, we're going to give him, we're going to move the next act up. Uh, in the earlier days when you used tapes, <laughs> when you used cassettes or things like that, it would be a nightmare if you were trying to move your scripts around. You'd, you'd use in the early days these three ring notebooks, you know, and you'd be pulling the plastic uh, covered pages in and out and going back and forth because now the whole thing has changed order. Uh, now with computers, uh, you know, where you have your scripting and, and when you've been doing it as long as I've been doing it, you really don't need the script. Um, you know the uh, you know the people involved. You know the aircraft. You can pretty much say it and, and pivot pretty quickly. But the music uh, playlists uh, can get swapped around on you. But with computers now, that is just so easy to manipulate those things that quickly. So it's usually a tap on the shoulder or something along that. When it comes to weather, that's where the safety aspect comes into mind too. Uh, I can remember doing a show uh, back in Wisconsin, uh, not Oshkosh, but. Uh, Manitowoc, is it Manitowoc? Somewhere in that area. And uh, and this goes back quite a few years where um, I was narrating away and suddenly realized standing to my left was the fire marshal. And in the background, I could hear what I thought was like an air raid siren going. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe somebody's getting ready for the warbirds and having their own little thing going on in the town. And uh, he was very polite. The fire marshal tapped me on the shoulder and, and said, Rick, uh, you, have to, you have to send everybody home. And I, I just thought, well, that's rather abrupt. <laughs> and I'm thinking there's protocols for that. And one of the protocols is that the fire chief does have a say in those kinds of things. So um, that's part of the, the planning. And I said, okay, uh, help me understand, though. Uh, why are we sending them home? And he says, you hear that siren? And I went, yeah. And he said, that's a tornado warning. We get them pretty bad in these parts. So that's why I'm trying to remember if this was the right place, because I've done so many and traveled to so many places. <laughs> and to make a long story short, uh, the audience didn't really need much of me to tell them to go. They knew from the siren. So by the time I realized my conversation with him was done, to turn to tell everyone that they should go to their cars and all, the place was pretty much empty. <laughs> they were already hightailing it out of there. And uh, the guy said, good luck. It's very close. He says, it's within about five miles of us now. And I could see the dark clouds. We've been watching them build. So Dan McLaren was doing the sound. And this is another wonderful relationship announcers uh, make over their careers is we get very connected to the sound guys. Uh, Dan McLaren, Mach 1 Productions. He's a fellow Canadian that also does many shows in the U.S. Uh, you've got Jay Rabbit now out there doing a continental sound and, and, and some others. And again, I'm going to get in trouble for not mentioning them all. But you build up these great rapports with them. They become great friends. And Dan uh, said, I've got to get what I can of my system away because it means damage and that's his career, you know, that's, that's his equipment. So he's loading stuff into the back of his truck as quickly as he can. And this thing's moving in and finally we realized we're not going to win this fight. We, we've got to get to safety. Let's just hop in his truck. And he had one of these dually trucks that pulled his trailer around, uh, a GM thing gmc and we, we got inside and the only reason i said gmc was because i said can you hear that and he says yeah it sounds like a train and i said don't they tell you that these things sound like a train when they're like almost on you and uh and dan said yeah but what are you worried about we've got onstar and i just i just started laughing because i thought he's got such a wonderful sense of humor and calmed me down in such a hurry so this storm rips through and it's gray green green clouds like they say the rain's going horizontal there's hail bouncing off of everything there's tents going by it's just a mess i, I saw everything but a cow like in the movie flip by but it was that bad and then it cleared and i thought okay well that wasn't so bad the truck rocked a little bit but you know i, I don't know if the funnel cloud was that close to us or what <laughs> but when it cleared 
it turned out that across the field, what we were hearing was in fact a train going by. <laughs> and Dan said, just looked at me with that look going, it was a train. <laughs> and, uh, and we all survived it, which was great. But that's, that's the closest call with that. I have done a show in Ottawa, uh, Canada, where, and I, I still want this kid to buy me a lottery ticket because two years in a row he was struck by lightning and survived it. Oh my God. Now, not, not, a, not a direct strike, but a strike that hits the tail of an airplane. And we always tell people don't stand under the wings during a, a thunderstorm. I mean, they're giant lightning rods and through the ground wire. And then it shot across the two or three inches of water that was forming under the airplane, caught him under the feet and skidded him across to a fence and uh and you know shook him up pretty bad and then the next year he came the same thing happened and it was remarkable <laughs> he's under the same there. plane again hey <laughs> well, God love him. and i just thought you know i i i really want to know what his name is you know and and, and i remember the organizer saying well that's really nice rick you want <laughs> his to, friends uh, call him about? lucky <laughs> I see you want to you want to write him a nice letter or something. I said, no, I want him to buy me a lottery ticket. <laughs> That's what I want him to do. But the kid, <clears> and I, th I think the kid is uh, now. And I did follow his story a little bit. I'm pretty sure he now flies for the RCAF. So it didn't deter him in the least. A good no, story. No, I mean, <laughs> after that, what do you? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I just remember us all going, "Oh boy, we've had another another person." that's been hit and you hear the radio chatter because uh, the security people are up with us. So we hear the chatter on the radio. And I said, did I just hear them say that somebody else has been hit? And, <laughs> and the fire guy saying, you're not going to believe us, but we think it's the same kid from last year. <laughs> oh, dear. Good times. Oh my goodness. That's, that's, so those nuts. are the weather stories. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll say that that's absolutely hilarious. Um, so take me back to some of the performers and uh, uh, some of the favorites. You talked about telling stories, and of course there are there are performers that are that that uh, hone their craft in, in precise aerobatics and things like that. And of course the national teams. Tell me about some of your favorites that are really storytellers. Well, the stories of I mean Mike Whiskus with Lucas Oil. Uh, Mike, you know, raised on a farm in Iowa and ends up uh, making quite a career for himself in Minnesota and being told all the time, he lost his father at a young age and, uh, and you know, kind of was a mischief maker at school and stuff and, and had a teacher tell him basically that he'd never be a pilot. He dreamed of being a pilot. He, he'd, he'd go out to the airports and, and you'll hear this story repeat a lot of times with a lot of guys where they went and volunteered their time to clean hangars, to clean airplanes, just to be around them. And he was like that. And, uh, and they got a tutor. His family ended up getting him a tutor. They gave him uh, the, the, little, the little train that could, the, that story, basically to get him uh, a little more motivated. And uh, he got focused on flying, did it, uh, showed that teacher, and then got committed to aerobatics big time, got onto the US teams, uh, you know, the silver medal winning team over in Europe uh, quite a few years ago now, then found the, uh, the airplane he has. Now there's, there's multi levels to his stories. So they, they, they find, and I love all of these aspects to be able to tell it while someone's flying. So he finds this wrecked uh, pits um, online uh, and take it as is, but it's pretty badly damaged. He gets it off of eBay for almost a steal, rebuilds it himself, uh, gets it flying again and makes a few modifications on it. He's been flying it now for almost his whole Lucas Oil career, which is coming up on near 20 years now, and uh, and really did a, a, a tremendous job in making that airplane what it is. And he flies the hell out of it and, uh, and loves every minute of that. Then you have these other stories around him where his son, uh, Shane, um, and he's always had a healthy lifestyle, he and Tammy, his wife, uh, up in Minnesota. And um, they raise these kids <laughs> as healthy kids. And uh, Shane uh, got into gymnastics, men's gymnastics. And uh, this year, after winning the Nissan Trophy for the, uh, you know, that's the highest prize you can get as a college athlete, 
Uh, he got that. Uh, he's been uh, the national champion and now represented the United States uh, in the Olympics and just finished oh, coming wow. back from Tokyo. So you've got, I mean, how great an all-American story is that? Yeah. And so that, that's Mike Wiskus. Uh, Tom Richard, if you want to go to uh, Warbirds and racing planes, Tom uh, is a guy that's T-H-O-M because he's from Sweden and uh, born and raised in Sweden, came over as a teenager with, I think, $2,000 from his grandfather in his pocket because he wanted to fly American Warbirds. That was his dream over there. Couldn't speak English. Uh, if you talk to Tom or you have him on this show, you will not hear an accent. Uh, his English is that good. What you will pick up a little bit is at times you'll think, he sounds a bit like Eddie Murphy. <laughs> and the reason he sounds like Eddie Murphy is he learned almost all of his English from listening to Eddie Murphy comedy tapes. <laughs> He'd sit this room, watch them on TV. That's where he learned a lot of his English. So fast forward now, he's come over here, he's made a career out of this, he's lived his dream, he flies uh, Warbirds, and he's finally bought the two-seat P-40 that he has that he calls American Dream, because that was his American Dream. He's lived it, he, he is, it's personified in everything he does. And, uh, and you, you wouldn't find, I mean, he is just so all-American and yet Swedish, <laughs> that it's another wonderful story. And, Look him up, Tom Richard. You'll you'll probably know him from the precious metal days at Reno Air Races with the uh, the Mustang with the counter rotating propellers. Sadly, he lost that airplane in a in a fire, not as a result of a crash, but a fire. And uh, and that is notoriously, infamously uh, famous. I can't really say that. I'm a, I, I use words for a living, and I just said that. I can't believe I did. <laughs> But the infamous video of him at the Formula One start, where the other plane comes up from behind. And you see the wing, he's just opening his canopy, and the wing from the other plane chops the canopy off, and he hurts, hurts his hand or whatever. That's Tom as well. And I think a lot of your viewers that know who Tom Richard is, but wow, quite a story. So that's just no a kidding. couple of the many remarkable stories in, in the industry. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that, um, that always hooks me with their shows are also the ones where the actual routine itself is a story. Uh, I, I grew up going to the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. That's probably what grabbed me in World War I. And they, and they had a whole storyline there of they have a little town and they go through the whole a whole scripted thing. And then, of course, there I know I'm going to say this wrong, but there's <laughs> the, the flying farmer routine <laughs> that, was, that was always done. The, tell me a little bit about those and 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 kind of how that fits into the air show world because that those warm my heart and there's variations on all of this now and some of the guys have gotten creative within the box and i think the guy that has probably done the best job of that uh is is kent peach uh, with his jelly belly interstate cadet and again the multi layers of stories kent flies usually about three times in a show he races uh well he doesn't race he lands on an rv or a pickup truck, that's one act. Uh, he also does just some simple aerobatics in the Interstate Cadet, and then he also does a comedy act uh, where he is uh, Chuck Gramamine and he's escaped from prison, and he built the airplane in prison, and he, he busts in on the show, and he usually comes very close to one of the aerobatic performers, and an aileron falls off, and he flies the entire comedy aerobatic routine with just one aileron, and that, that speaks to his talent as a pilot as well. And it's, it's pee your pants out, laugh out loud funny because of his narration from the cockpit. He plays this uh, deadpan character, uh, you know, his name is Chuck. So one of the, one of the setups in it is uh, he's diving at the ground and you're, you're to say over and over again, pull up Chuck, pull up Chuck, pull up Chuck. And he, he comes back with a quick retort and says, I think I just did. And it just <laughs> like that. It's all quippy one liners. And, and sometimes there's fresh ones in there today that break me up because it's like he's off the script now and just having fun. So outside of those stories and, and the theatrics in that and, and jelly uh, belly jelly beans sponsor him, which is just so perfect. The airplane's got jelly beans all over it and he throws them out to the kids and all that good stuff. But he, at one time, if you know the story of Pearl Harbor, there was a, a, a student and a flight instructor 
that encountered the uh, the Japanese attack planes first, and, and they were yeah. shot at. They managed to land, force land the airplane on the ground and, and got away. Kent owned that interstate cadet for a while, and that was the that interstate exact cadet plane. he was using. That exact plane. He has since sold it, and someone who wants to see it, you know, in its proper place now has taken care of that. But he had that amongst his other interstate cadets. And uh, and that was another layer of story again that we could tell people that that very plane was the plane or now that he at one time owned it. So he's fallen in love with that airplane and restores them and, 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 and has more than one uh, because a lot of our air show performers uh, either position them around the country uh, or have them as backups because it's, it's how they're earning their money. Uh, so they'll have more than one show plane. And uh, and that's that's Kent's story there. But his family also has a very historic past in air shows. Uh, his father was a well-known pilot. His brother uh, Warren uh, was also an aerobatic pilot. They had a whole family act together: father and the two sons that used to do similar things. Uh, and then now Warren is branched off into warbirds, and uh, he's like a he's a, a museum unto himself. He just is so knowledgeable about the history of these World War II airplanes that he flies. He has such a passion for it. And the two of them are just uh, uh, wonderful people too. Just, you couldn't find nicer people than, than the Peach family. Wow. Now, are there are there some shows in particular that just really, really stand out for you? I mean, for example, I, I probably will never see anything top of the year at Air Venture at Oshkosh when, I think it was Oshkosh called at the time, when it was celebration of D-Day and they literally had so many aircraft from around the world that when they finally reenacted that and they had them all turn on their landing lights at the same time, miles and miles and miles away, it looked like it was nighttime with stars when that finally hit. I don't think I'll ever forget that air show. Are there ones like that for you? There are, and, and Oshkosh is, is such a great example of, of size and, and a gathering of everyone. I, I had the privilege of uh, hosting the uh, Young Eagles Gala a few years ago at Oshkosh and really got, because I was, you know, basically doing the one night of the uh, MC work inside for the auction and the, and the dinner gala, got to enjoy the show, just being out and being around and taking everything in and including the museum. And I was determined to get as much in, I can sleep later, you know, get as much of that in and soak it up. So I very much enjoyed that. There are different, um, I can't pick a favorite because it would offend half the people I work for if I did that. <laughs> but at, at the same time, I, I can say with confidence that uh, it's different strokes for different folks too. Uh, the Santa Cole show in Belgium is done in such a hospitable way in an environment where in Europe they are competing with Formula One and those kinds of events to where there's an expectation to the ticket holder that you be wined and dined and entertained at that level. So their uh, hospitality is at that level. It's crystal and silver and wine and, uh, and a huge uh, VIP air-conditioned facility that I kid you not is half as long as the runway with a glass ceiling so that people while they're eating or dining or drinking and socializing can still watch the show above. Uh, oh they go God. to that kind of, yeah, it's, it's really quite, quite different and spectacular. Uh, and in North America, you know, is something as really fun as fleet week in San Francisco where it's free to the public. Marina green, of course they have their VIP areas and the chalet areas uh, where you buy these premium tickets. But um, it's free to see that many people come out in San Francisco where it's an interesting place because there's going to be protesters. And they're down in front of us at Muni Pier as we're going by. And we welcome them, too. There's no shunning them or ever they go by in their little kayaks and, and, and uh, you know, cry for, you know, peace, not war and stuff. Who's going to argue with that anyway? Uh, it's just, war is not something that, uh, you know, you want to glorify and we don't. Uh, in the air shows, we point out the sacrifices and stuff, but uh, no one really wants to go there. Uh, so you have these, uh, this whole dynamic in San Francisco, and yet it's supported so tremendously well. The turnout is huge. There's millions of people along, uh, you know, Fisherman's Wharf in, in behind Muni Pier, up over to Marina Green and all those wonderful areas of San Francisco. They just pack themselves down there to watch this event in the Bay. 
and it's uh, it's spectacular with Alcatraz as show center, and you've got you know the uh, Golden Gate Bridge off to the left and uh, at the right when you're looking down, and you can see the Bay Bridge and stuff, and uh, that's that's a very exciting show to do. And then not too far from there, Huntington Beach, uh, you know, Surf City, USA, and they'll pack close to 200 or 2 million people in there over a three-day period. And the beach is just filled up with people. And that's a very simple show in that it's on the beach and it's, again, over water. Uh, and then you get to the hospitality of some of the, uh, some of the great shows across the Midwest, uh, up into Canada, too, or places like Abbotsford. Uh, London, Ontario, we put on a great show, the Canadian International Air Show in Toronto, uh, Montreal when it was, and they're resurrecting a show uh, coming up next year in Montreal again. And that's interesting because that's the aviation hub of Canada. That's where most of the aviation companies are. Bombardier, you know, Pratt & Whitney, Canada, they're all situated in Montreal. So it's an aerospace capital for Canada, and it, it should be having an air show. And they've got three major airports there, so there's lots of room to do it. So. Uh, having said that, uh, to try and, and, and pick favorites, they're all done differently. Uh, probably my most favorite stop, though, because of the combination of all of that, the hospitality, uh, what they put on in a show, how they own that whole airspace is the California Capitol Air Show in Sacramento. And they're always innovating and telling stories, like you just mentioned now, to where they'll pick a theme. And this year it's women in aviation, which is a great theme. And, uh, and uh, they will build the story all around that for the weekend. And they've done an excellent job year after year with all of the things they've focused on. That is so, so cool. Now, you've had some great experiences yourself. Uh, that You, uh, among your credits, are an honorary member of the Snowbirds. Uh, now, uh, I, I've been fortunate to get to see the Snowbirds fly, of course. They are spectacular to see them perform, uh, especially so many aircraft and in the formations that they do. Uh, tell me that story. Well, it, they surprised me. Uh, it was a little more than 10 years ago uh, at the at the Toronto Shore. I call it the Toronto Shore with the Canadian International Show in Toronto. And uh, at the dinner gala, uh, made me an honorary snowbird. And it was quite an honor. And I was pretty emotional about it. Um, and I have flown with them. I flew with them back in uh, 1985 with Yogi Hugo Bear was the was the lead then. And uh, I took my camera along, and I was in the media at the time, and it was the thrill of a lifetime uh, to get in, the in with the team, to see the concentration, um, to know, uh, you know, I didn't know about the, uh, the uh, stick having all of the, uh, the back pull on it, um, that they put all of this pound poundage with the trim to make sure that, you know, they have to hold on to it, and that's how it smooths out the ride. I know that that was a... a a bit of an issue with the switching over of the Blue Angels to the Super Hornet. They had to find a way to get the spring on the control stick to, to make it nice and tight. They've done that. And T Tell uh, me a little bit about that, because I think you glossed over that a little bit, but that's something that I think people would love to hear. Well, when they get in nice and tight, and, and those who fly will know, you know what the stick feels like, what your control stick feels like. Imagine now if you're getting in really tight and at that speed, uh, in a formation, and, and I don't think anybody flies closer than the Blue Angels do, but uh, and the Snowbirds do a bit of an overlap too. So you're in nice and tight. They trim the airplane up so that there's pounds of back pressure. Uh, I think it's more than 20 pounds. I've forgotten now. You've got me on the spot now. So that it's constantly in their hands. So it's not loose. You know, it's it's really tight. It feels heavy. So that they're really, as they're concentrating, they're feeling it and they're they're in tight. And it just gives them a better sense of control. They can explain that better than I can because, again, remember tail, tail dragger, Piper Cub versus <laughs> high jet, and why they yeah, need but the that. Yeah, the bottom line is they want to they want to be fighting the stick. They want to have a lot of weight against them. That's right, and and they do, and their hand is down on their on their leg, and, and it's nice and firm. Um, so uh, there's there's that aspect to it, um, but. The most important thing, I think, and what I learned in that is going through the briefing with them, uh, where they go through the whole scenario around the table, verbalizing it as though they're imagining before they fly. Uh, all of the calls, all of the calling that they do, all the radio calls and everything are done around the table. Uh, it's not funny. It may look funny <laughs> to an outsider watching them go through this, but the concentration, the discipline, uh, the, t the uh, team playing, uh, the relying on one another, 
is, uh, is just so crucial and such a big element of all of that beyond what we see and are amazed by is the, uh, the dedication, again, and the teamwork and the commitment that goes into it. And uh, I think they're all a tight group. Uh, yeah. You know, I think they, they are for years afterwards as well because of that. And it speaks to the military and, and a different way of uh, pursuing aviation as a career. Yeah. And, you know, I have always heard, and I don't know if it's true, but but I've always heard that that for many of these uh, military erratic teams, uh, they progressively throughout the season get, uh, tighten up and tighten up and tighten up their performance and get closer and closer together as they get as they get through their season. Uh, do you know, is that the case? Do you, what do you see in differences if, since you are going to be following, you see so many of the same acts over and over again through a season? Well, and, and I think this is part of the reason why the, the military teams uh, change about half the team every, you know, every two years. Uh, and recently it's gone to, in some cases, three years because they want it, they don't want complacency um, and they don't want it all to change at once. So it's kind of split up for half the team does it this year and then half the team the next year going out. So the team is always evolving and changing. Right now, through what's happened with COVID, and we should probably talk about how it's changed the air show industry too before this, this is done, but when it comes to military aviation right now, particularly in Canada and somewhat in the States as well, is that as all of these pilots have been furloughed and, and out, a lot of them, as the recovery has been so slow in the aviation industry that they have re-enlisted, gone back in to the military to continue their careers now. What that's meant for the Snowbirds this year is that it's probably one of the most experienced teams they've had in a long time. And what was happening preceding that, at I think all levels and all nations, uh, was we were getting younger, lower time pilots because there was so much need in the commercial aspect of things as careers were going on, they were leaving the military. So it's really strengthened things since. And, uh, and over uh, the past few months, as air shows, as the International Council of Air Shows puts it, air shows are back. We have seen since they've been going, and some of the lessons that were learned last year for the shows that were able to do drive-in formats, over-the-water shows, and pivot and actually put these events on safely during the pandemic, some of these ideas are manifesting themselves into the future now. Kevin Walsh at Thunder Over Michigan uh, just uh, came up with a, a new idea of doing a matinee show and an e a late afternoon evening show. And uh, they're full shows, two shows in one day. The first show uh, with the uh, Thunderbirds, I believe, unless I've got it backwards. The Thunderbirds were the, uh, were the star attraction in the uh, full show in the morning and the Blue Angels in the afternoon or vice versa. And uh, that, went, that went over really well. Two complete turnovers, so because they brought in smaller crowds because of, uh, of what was going on with the, with the pandemic and the rules as we're coming out of this. Uh, so that was a way to pivot and, and do something differently. The drive-in formats have been successful to the point where London, Ontario, I think are loving the idea. And certainly some of the spectators are bringing the cars in on the ramp. You don't get a static display so much out of a, a show like that, which is an aspect of air shows that's missing and where you actually connect people to be able to go into the airplane and sit in the cockpit or talk to the crews, which I think is essential to really putting the hooks in. But without that, uh, they're still getting the flying demonstration done and bringing people in and out uh, faster, not in as big a number, but in vehicles. And then these over-the-water shows have, uh, have been quite spectacular as well along the beaches on the East Coast, like Cocoa Beach, uh, Ocean City, uh, places like that that have uh, seen big crowds come out with, in a lot of space to where along the beach they can socially distance themselves. Right. Uh, and that's becoming less of an issue now with the vaccinations and stuff. So what we're seeing are these huge numbers of people coming back to air shows uh, where everything's selling out quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. People have missed it and, and want to see it again. And, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's turning out great. I think it's, uh, it's going to bring us up to another level now as far yeah. as the showman goes and, and, and adapting to this. It must have been very, very challenging uh, 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 during the early days uh, of, of the pandemic in the industry of what's going to happen to everyone. Um, was, can you give me a little it, insight to that? I sure can. Uh, the, and the people, not, not a lot of the industry, uh, the majority of the industry uh, don't do it full time. 
there's a growing number of people within the industry that do. Uh, some of the uh, performers uh, with their airplanes and, and all of that responsibility and, and financial um, costs. Uh, and then there are, you know, and then myself included and some others who rely on this for their income and it was all disappearing. Well, very early on, uh, a fellow uh, colleague, friend, and fellow air show announcer, Matt Jolly, who we do the, the show center, the air show podcast with, uh, and Rob Ryder, but Matt came up with the idea that we should do a socially distant air show uh, in the earliest moments of this, when, when we realized the pandemic was very real and that uh, shows were being canceled, everything was being canceled. Uh, we put out feelers and got the cooperation of the International Council of Air Shows to put on this socially distant air show where we call in all our favors from the Red Arrows over in the UK, the Poultry de France in France, the Thunderbirds, um, you know, uh, all of our performers uh, to give us something, get some original video out, do a show at your own airport, your own backyard without crowds or whatever. If you can't, I can't if Kent Peach put together a paper airplane or something and threw it across the room. If there's, if there's anything at all you can put together for us, we'll put it together in a three-day air show, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, as if it's the real deal, and we'll go live to these tape segments. Uh, or recorded segments, and uh, and present it as the socially distant air show. Um, and as it started to grab ground, Grippen got involved in Sweden. They wanted to put their demo in, uh, and they they did a video for us. The Brazilian team. It became this worldwide thing, and we did it as a fundraiser and asked people watching it worldwide. And I think we had over two million views, uh, and it's still available online the socially distant air show it's on youtube through live air show tv and i can't say this without extolling their uh, their help too because live air show tv jeff lee and brian and the rest of the team there were amazing to help us get this done and uh, and present it live and the challenges of that were i had to do it from uh, here you know in, in the kingston ontario area matt from atlanta where he's rob in ohio and we're the hosts, so we've got all that hooked up, and you're doing live streaming right now. You know what it's like. And then we had to bring all these other aspects in from all over the place. And Jeff was down in Texas, and the hub, apparently, if I've got this right now, the hub where all of the stuff that was recorded was coming out of was in Detroit. So we got all of this together and managed to, to pull it off and raise some much-needed uh, funds for some of the people that were hardest hit within our industry. And I'm proud to say that for which, in the, in the end, we ended up getting an ICAS award for it, an international award for that broadcast. So I can't thank Matt enough for having the idea and then everybody else who helped us execute it. And, uh, and it was fun to do that. But yes, there were some people that um, it's still been hard for them to come back after all of this. Uh, but we're helping one another. And that's the other thing about the Airshow family is it's a real family. Uh, we do like to help one another and uh, and make sure that we're all looked after when, when times are tough. Yeah. Yeah. And that is certainly that's why we have the show Social Flight Live. So that is exactly what, what we're here for. And, and it makes a lot of sense. And and what you said brings me back to one of the early the early days, even of our show. And, and Jack Pelton was on from EAA. And, and we were talking about th that was a time when there was a, a lot of uh, uh, confusion and a lot of stress over the idea of should people be flying, um, even if even if it is one person flying alone in their you know going just going driving to the hangar is that essential travel the things that all of, all of that and there was this spirit in the discussion of what we were trying to accomplish of if if that. If that one person can can go out and pull that pits out, climb up and just just get into the sky on their own, that there's gonna th there's gonna be a kid in a backyard somewhere that looks up and sees that and is inspired by that, is is puts a smile on his face when everyone's stressed with everything that's going on. Jack talked about the what it felt like to pull his steerman out of the hangar alone, but go into the sky just get out there and do it and and what that that meant at that moment seems very very connected to the work that you do and the work that everyone in the airso industry does to inspire so many in in, in whatever times there are 
Well, I, I can sum it up too in the other picture I gave you because you started this with the picture of my dad and I sitting on the uh, the spinner of the cup, and then the the other picture. Now, my dad, sadly, this this happened ten years ago, but I I thought of my dad a lot. Uh, I lost him in the mid 1980s. Uh, he died way too young, not aviation related. It was health related, but. Uh, uh, this moment was the, the thrill of my life, and all of the years I've been doing this, this was just a great moment. Uh, Eric O'Connor, the uh, uh, the demonstration pilot for the CF-18 10 years ago, uh, asked me if I wanted to go for a ride, and uh, I, I went on a fitness program for about six months to make sure <laughs> that I had lost enough weight to get in there. They squeezed me in, and, uh, and I just love the glasses. And the one thing that I'll note, and we did um, – I think I pulled up to 7.9 G. Uh, he wanted to try me for the 9 G turn, but uh, I was having too much fun doing other things. So I said, you know what? This was too much fun. I, I still want to land and still be intact and not getting sick and all that stuff. But we did a lot of stuff in the fighter plane. And if you'll notice, um, you can tell I'm not really a fighter pilot. If you look at my right hand in that picture, <laughs> you notice that I am hanging on for dear life. He did let me fly it. We experienced supersonic flight. Uh, I got to roll the airplane and uh, and do a nice big loop with it. And uh, the wingman there stayed with us for a while, then left us alone. And uh, we had a lot of fun over the skies of Saskatchewan. And that's what's underneath below us is Saskatoon. Uh, and uh, it's nice and flat out there, so we didn't have to worry about running into any mountains or obstacles. And Brian Swidrovich, uh, who promoted that show for years, as nothing more uh, than a tribute to veterans, and uh, so that we'll always remember their sacrifices. Uh, that's what that show was all about, and he did such a great job of it and made sure I got into that seat and got that ride. So uh, that, for me, is the highlight. And uh, that's a good beginning and a good ending in our story here today, yes. I think, Jeff. Absolutely. And and with that, I just want to say thank you so much, Rick Peterson, for joining us this evening on Social Flight Live, taking us behind the scenes of an air show, of what goes on that sounds like there is so, so much to your industry, and you've had a, a, a remarkable life with so, so much more to come, I'm sure, with uh, with air shows coming back and, and, uh, and seeing people return to them, and as you mentioned, new variations of them that we haven't yet seen. Yep, it's, it's going to be a, a terrific fall now as things ramp up even better. And uh, I'll be heading off to Toronto for the Canadian International Air Show uh, every day weekend. And then I'm back on the road again. Some of the other guys like uh, Rob and Matt and them are already out there and, and picking it up. Uh, so I'll be there. Then Sacramento, Fleet Week, uh, probably Huntington Beach as well. And Denver, just outside of Denver, Loveland Airport, uh, before my season ends. It'll be a brief one this year, but at the same time, it feels so good to be back. And that's the hashtag we're using at the International Council of Air Shows is hashtag air shows are back. And they are in a big way. Isn't that fantastic? And I'll remind everyone out there that all of these air shows and all the different places that you will be able to see Rick and all of the performers out there are available just at socialflight.com and in those mobile apps. So go there, check them out. Find an air show near you, go experience it, or one that isn't near you and make a vacation out of it, because this is our industry. And I can tell you, having only uh, been back from Air Venture a, a couple weeks or so, um, I, uh, I, I'd go back in, in a heartbeat. I'd, I'd get out in my car and start driving right now to get back out there and back into that environment around uh, so, so many other people in this wonderful aviation community. And so with that, thank you so, so much, Rick, for joining us this evening on Social Flight Live. And thank you to all of you in the audience for taking time again out of one of your evenings to join us. We are here every Tuesday evening on Social Flight Live. Next Tuesday, August 24th, Rick Perry of the Aviation Electronics Association is here, and he is going to talk about revolutions in avionics and all of the things that have happened and some of the things you might not know are coming to the aviation cockpit near you. And then another week later on Tuesday, August 31st, Vic Syracuse is here. We'll be talking all about experimental aircraft, which uh, somewhere behind me here is, is our T-51D Mustang in the world that they're, we are in as well. With that, I'd just like to say again, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to Rick for joining us this evening. And I wish all of you 
Blue skies. 